Hello and welcome to our final session of AAMFT's At Home Series. My name is Tracy Todd and I am the CEO of AAMFT. When we started this effort six weeks ago, we simply aimed to have an opportunity to come together as a professional community and share ways and ideas that MFTs could use to help us navigate this unprecedented crisis. But I know for myself, the shared time together each week has grown to mean much more than that. Recognizing that over the course of six weeks, this at home series has provided an opportunity for thousands of my own peers to come together, reflect and simply share time has truly been a rewarding experience. I hope you have also enjoyed it. While it still may be some time before we can start to connect together in person, I know AMFT will continue to offer ways to connect with other professionals navigating these hard times. Our MFT virtual hangouts continues for members, and today I'm proud to announce that AMFT's Institutes for Advanced Systemic Family Therapy will be held virtually this year on June 25 and 26. If you have never attended our advanced institutes, then here's your chance to try from home. The institutes are designed with the experienced clinician in mind. Through intentionally intimate settings, emphasizing thought-provoking discussions with peers on cutting edge topics, the institutes are the perfect training for those who want to get below the surface level and engage with other specialists. This year's featured intensives hit on all areas of couple and family therapy with some of the leading trainers in our field, David Treadway, Menage Dinashpur, Scott Sells, Christopher Haven, and Sarah Lyons. For more information, visit amft.org slash institutes. Registration for the event will be opening very soon. Today's session is being sponsored by CPH and Associates. As the endorsed professional liability insurance provider for AMFT members, CPH and Associates is proud to sponsor the AAMFT at home series. CPH provides portable occurrence form coverage that protects you throughout your professional career. During this time of evolving practices, CPH is pleased to assure you that their policy covers telehealth services as long as such services are permitted under your state's law. A policy with CPH provides peace of mind so you can focus on your career. Get policy highlights and an instant quote online at www.cphins.com. Com. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you to today's presenter, Dr. Froma Walsh. Dr. Walsh is co-director and co-founder of the Chicago Center for Family Health and is the Mose and Sylvia Firestone Professor Emerita in the School of Social Service Administration and Department of Psychiatry, Pritzker School of Medicine at the University of Chicago. She is a licensed clinical psychologist and an AMFT approved supervisor. Dr. Walsh, an internationally respected leader in the field of family therapy and is the foremost authority on family resilience. She has developed a resilience-oriented, community-based practice approach to strengthen families in crisis, for example, major trauma and loss in disruptive transitions such as separation, divorce, and migration, and facing challenges of persistent multi-stress conditions such as illness, disability, economic hardship, and discrimination. Her research informed family resilience framework is widely applied in intervention and prevention efforts. She is also a noted expert on contemporary family diversity, on multi-faith spiritual perspectives, and on the relational significance of the human animal bond. Her approach addresses developmental, systemic, cultural, and spiritual influences in suffering, healing, and resilience. Dr. Walsh is a frequent speaker and consultant nationally and internationally on resilience-oriented community mental health training, practice, and research. So without further ado, welcome Dr. Walsh. Thank you very much, Tracy. Um, I'm very happy to be part of this series. Um, this is a, a very challenging time for all of us. And I guess the theme of uh, my talk today is we are all in this together, therapists, clients, uh, people who are on the front lines, people we depend on uh, that we didn't realize how much 
we depended on. Uh, and I'm hoping that today uh, we'll just have a chance to talk about some of the disruptions, but really focus on the losses that people are experiencing today, ourselves included. And to talk about how uh, having a resilience orientation in our practice and working systemically, uh, we can begin to help people cope and heal from very tragic losses, particularly the loss of a loved one, but other losses that are being experienced now as well. And that we can help them grow out of that experience, which is really what resilience is all about. So let me begin. All right. Um, so this is what love looks like in the time of coronavirus. Uh, you see bride and groom on the left, uh, that's wonderful, but we also know a lot of young people are having to cancel and postpone plans for weddings right now. Uh, there's a timeout being experienced in a sense that maybe uh, people who are graduating aren't going to have the same kinds of celebrations and future opportunities uh, that they really deserve to have and have always looked forward to. Uh, we also see couples living together, uh, really wondering what's safe, what's not safe, and how to navigate uh, this time ahead. There are couples living at a distance, um, and I think this is something that uh, many MFTs have had experience with, uh, going on uh, practicum placements, or going off for training, or being moved to better locations, or living far away from their parents and maybe their grandparents as well. So this living at a distance is really uh, a very challenging uh, for so many people today. What I said was some of us have already had that experience and maybe we can draw on what's worked from that in the past. I know uh, I want to situate myself in this pandemic time. Uh, I feel very fortunate. Uh, we have a home that's comfortable, it's safe. Uh, I have my husband to share burdens with and share some joys. Uh, I have my loving dog Shasta, who is still with us at 14 and a half, amazingly. Um, and we have a neighborhood where we can walk fairly, fairly freely uh, with masks and that we can get food delivered. Not everyone is so fortunate to have uh, the kinds of um, uh, privileges that we have during this time. And yet it's still hard. We're going to talk about all of that as we go forward. I want to focus on loss because I think that in mental health training and in MFT training, um, there hasn't been enough focus on loss. We tend to be uh, in this era of training and practice very much focused on the here and now and on moving forward and ahead on solution-focused ways of approaching things. And we haven't uh, paid enough attention to the devastating losses uh, that can contribute to other problems and ripple through the family. Um, and we haven't really maybe had enough experience working pe with people who are now experiencing uh, traumatic and complicated losses. Uh, I might say that this is just a few things I'm going to be talking about uh, today. Uh, I'm working on a book now on uh, traumatic and complicated loss, uh, how, how to foster healing and resilience. Because I think that um, most work in this area is in the bereavement field, and it's mostly individually focused and not systemic. So um, I'm going to take this time to talk a little bit more about working with loss. In this pandemic, uh, people are experiencing multiple losses. There's the complicated traumatic deaths that I'll spend more time with. It may be a significant relationship or it could be a role in the family, the matriarch or the breadwinner. It could be a role of someone on the front lines uh, who is tragically stricken 
uh, with the virus while helping others. It's also a time of sudden loss, unexpected, and often ambiguous. How did it happen? How did we get it? A time of extreme suffering in facing that illness and death. It's a terrible way to die. Also complicating these losses is that loved ones are unable to be at the bedside uh, with their dying family member, or their spouse, a sibling, and traditional funeral rites can't be held, and even some burial rites it's restricted in who can attend. So there's a lot of disruption, a lot of grief that isn't processed in ways that cultures have traditionally and over millennia helped families and communities to do that. So I think over time, we're going to be needing uh, to work with more people who are just doing the best they can at this time getting through it, but may need more help with loss in the coming months and even in the coming years. Um, other kinds of losses, this loss of physical contact that so many are experiencing, I just want to hug or kiss my loved one. Uh, I want to be physically present, close. Uh, this idea of social distance we all realize now is really physical distance because it's helped us recognize more than ever how much we need each other, how much we need physical contact. And as much as we're doing our best with Zoom, and thank you Zoom for today, um, it doesn't replace being really in the same place and being up close and being personal. Uh, I had the strange experience of having to go for a medical uh, procedure in a hospital just a few weeks ago, and uh, the hospital was strange, uh, not normal, and the physician, who I hadn't met before, a man was masked, and I was masked, and uh, it was not, it was, it was a very strange experience. So we're realizing more than ever um, what, how this uh, virus, how this pandemic not only has disrupted our lives, but how we're going to have to manage over a very long time. But there is, for many people, a sense of loneliness, a yearning, uh, for often for past uh, people who have died or, or who are currently at a distance that can't be reached. A feeling of being disconnected, that's very common right now. Um, I know for us in our lives, our daughter, um, Claire, is working in international humanitarian services for International Medical Corps, halfway around the world in the Middle East, had planned to move back to New York on April 1st. Her plans were upended. She is still living in Beirut and still asking, when is it safe to come back? And I think those are questions that we're all asking because there's so many uncertainties that we're dealing with. Now we've learned because she's been living abroad for a long time, uh, we've relied on FaceTime. We've relied first on Skype where we connect every day. Uh, she's baking something and I'm on FaceTime with her saying maybe, yes, you could use that or you could substitute that that we do much more interaction. She calls on a hard day and says, will you take a picture of Shasta and send it to me? Or tell me a story about Shasta. What did she do today? So um, I think this coping over, across distances is something that we're going to get used to. And I hope that we learn better ways to do it. Financial security livelihood is a big one. Um, so many people with the unemployment, the job losses, the uncertainty about whether jobs will return, looking into the future, perhaps many years. Uh, and that is an anxiety that people are carrying with them, as well as maybe a sense of grief for those who think they may not be able to pursue a career or a pathway professionally that they had always dreamed of. And that gets into the hopes and dreams that we don't know. Um, some are lost and some remain uncertain. 
In all, I think there's a sense of normalcy that's been lost in this time. Um, there's a, a term called uh, shattered assumptions, shattered illusions in the bereavement field. And it's about the sense in traumatic experiences or in major extreme disruptions, the loss of predictability, the loss of a sense of safety, loss of trust, who can I trust, who is safe? Um, loss of a sense of control over our lives. The loss of freedom with lockdowns, with we see people marching in the streets, they just want to go out and do their thing. Um, we have a mayor in Chicago who is really tough love. She's fabulous. Um, and she said, uh, okay, I'm gonna, this was an experiment a few weeks ago, I'm gonna open the beaches, but if you gather out there, and not at safe distance, and you're not wearing masks, I'm going to have to shut it down. She opened it up. They didn't listen to her. She came back, and she shut it down. So we're going to be going through this time um, of trying to get uh, to a better place. But at this time, the paradox while we're being locked down is that we're also feeling very unmoored. We don't, we feel at a loss as to uh, what the future holds and what to do ourselves about it. So it's not surprising that there's a lot of grief being experienced, a tangled ball of emotions. So this idea that we had from the work of Kubler-Ross about these neat stages that you pass through in grief uh, and you get to the other side of it, that's really not what research finds. Uh, I think of it more like facets of, of maybe a gemstone where uh, we turn, turn it around and, and we're going to be having many different ones. And if we think about a family system, different members are going to have different feelings come up at different times. They're going to be in different pacings. So it is going to be very complex for us to um, be able to process and share and be empathic with this whole ball of, of tangled emotions. What's it about? Well, we can't go out, it's not safe. Uh, that little sign on the right, someone in Santa Fe, New Mexico, painted over um, a, walk, a walking sign, free, safe, safe to walk. Uh, and uh, most of us down in the corner, uh, we're ordering to go or curb service if we can. Our travel plans for the future have been dashed. Conferences, uh, we were hoping to go to a conference in Japan uh, in the fall. No. Uh, and this is maybe, a, a, I love to collect cartoons because sometimes words aren't enough and pictures help to give me just a moment of humor uh, in the midst of feeling sorry for myself or sad for other people who really are more restricted. <laughs> And I think with all the confusing information that we're getting, uh, I love this cartoon. He's, this is uh, Booth. He says, I'd just like to know what's happening. He's talking to the dog. Do you know what's happening? Because we don't know what's happening. We don't know uh, uh, how we're going to get ahead. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the old normal, the new normal. <laughs> I love this cartoon. She says uh, to her partner, are you talking about the new normal of an hour ago, or is there a new, new normal right now? And I think this is the one I, I love best. Um, husband and wife are sitting there uh, for the long haul because we've, we're kind of moving out of the crisis phase of feeling uh, disrupted and uh, the sense of shock. And we're realizing uh, that We've got to deal with this for a while. And uh, the husband is watching too much TV and it says, hell still on fire. Uh, and I think that's how I feel every day when I tune in. Uh, and she's saying to him, you're making this worse. So, uh, and for us uh, working at home, uh, we are getting better acquainted with telehealth. Uh, and I love this because uh, uh, maybe we look pretty good on the camera, uh, but I don't know, the rest of our house and the rest of our lives uh, may be a little bit of a mess because we just can't hold it all together. Uh, and again, I think we have to just think about this, whether we're therapists, 
or clients, whether we're rich or poor, we have to all be in this together. We have to recognize that vulnerability is human. Some, as I'll talk about later, are more vulnerable than others, not of their own making or their own fault. Distress is normal in abnormal times, and we have to help people to contextualize and normalize these intense feelings that are coming up right now. We need and depend on each other more than ever right now. So I wanna talk about the big one, facing death and loss. And from an individual to a systemic perspective, how in our work do we help those who are suffering to mourn a tragic death and to adapt the, to all that was lost? How do we help them to celebrate and honor the life that was lived, to navigate the challenges ahead, and to go forward to live and love fully? So from a systemic perspective, if we look at traumatic and complicated loss, we see that it affects all family members, their relationships, and family functioning. The shock waves reverberate throughout the relational network, and that ongoing stressors compound the distress. Also, what the family does to prepare and respond will influence the adaptation or the maladaptation of all members, their relationships, and the whole family unit. Whether it survives or breaks apart, or whether it goes, grows stronger. And in this time, we need to think about collective trauma and collective healing, as my colleague Jack Saul is working on, and how when we work with whole communities, not only families, uh, we can help in, uh, in groups, in forums, in workshops, um, to help not only families, but their entire communities uh, to heal and grow stronger out of this experience. So understanding grief and mourning process is just some misconceptions that are important to understand that there is no one right way uh, to grieve well um, or a normal grief process. That there are many varied pathways and varied facets of grief that can be reactivated. There's a need to respect differences in couples, family members, that there are cultural differences, individual differences, differences for children and other vulnerable members, different developmental stages. And it depends on the particular relationships that were lost. Those are gonna be unique in a family for each member. Um, and past losses that may be reactivated. Um, Monica McGoldrick and I began working in this area uh, back in our training because um, we started to notice that many of the families that were coming in for help or individuals presenting uh, with depression or anxiety or other troubles or relational distress, when we talked with them more about their experience and their family history, we started noticing a lot of losses that were unattended, tragic losses that went underground and were coming up now in other symptoms. Um, so those are things that we will over time need to keep into our awareness. Unhelpful is this myth of closure. I know Pauline Boss and Monica and I have written about this. This idea in our culture, because we're kind of, as Americans, never dealt well with loss, death, and grief. Uh, we like to think of it uh, kind of as the no muss, no fuss. Uh, in kind of, uh, you put it behind you, uh, you get some closure, you get over it, and you move on. And the research and our clinical experience shows that that's not really a healthy way. Um, 
The same is true with this traditional view out of uh, psychodynamic uh, theory that you detach from losses, you decathect, you let go. And uh, you put the, the persons or the loved one or the life you've lost behind you and you don't look back. Uh, it's same with the faulty view of resilience is just bounce back. Um, what's helpful is to understand that recovery processes take time, that we should expect suffering, struggle, setbacks. And what healing and resilience are about is struggling well through it. It's not, uh, don't worry, be happy, <laughs> um, or uh, just keep on uh, like the Energizer Bunny. But resilience comes out of the, su the suffering and the struggle. And that there's meaning making and learning that can come from that experience. We may have to also revise our hopes and dreams, revision our future lives, and integrate the experience into the chapters of our lives and our larger relationships, our constellations of important families, whether we are born into them whether we construct them, whether we turn to them, the people that matter to us. So the most important is the recognition that death ends a life, but not a relationship. So often, as I mentioned, Monica and I would be working with people who were still carrying unfinished business. I don't like the word unfinished because I don't think we ever finish it. But things that they're still turning over in their minds. And that's going to be happening now because these losses were sudden, some so tragic, I couldn't be there. Or I'm afraid that maybe I carried the virus and I gave it to him, I gave it to my grandmother. Or, you know, I'm responsible. And, I, I, and so we're going to be dealing with a lot of complex feelings about that. How do we help people to work with those and to see that they can continue bonds with their loved ones that are lost, to find ways that honor and sustain the connections. I think the theme of love for me is much bigger in our connections. So to me, they are one and the same. How do we sustain that as we move forward? And they're no longer physically present to us, but we can hold memorial, memorial gatherings, maybe not now, but later, streaming. I had a cousin pass away last year in Montreal, and the family uh, sent me um, a link so that I could be there at present for the funeral. And I thought, hmm, the first time I'm ever doing this, and it's in Montreal. Now it wasn't, I couldn't go to the funeral. It wasn't the same as actually being there. But it really comforted me to feel like in some way I was a part of that experience. We're finding people using internet connections, setting up websites. This has been going on for some time. Immigrant families, families that are bicultural, that live in different parts of the world with different parts of their networks. A good friend's husband passed away. They had lived for many years in Africa, working for United Nations. Her daughter set up a website um, where everyone could leave tributes, could leave memories, could leave photos of what he had meant to them, what their relationships had meant. And she herself created a, a scrapbook online. So we had models for this and we need ourselves to kind of maybe speed up that process of using the internet, using these resources in creative ways. Also to share with those who are around us, either physically close or phys physically distant, memories, stories, photos. I love the word keepsakes. I wear scarves a lot and they keep me close to my mother. Uh, she had scarves and she passed one along to me that is very important and I feel her closeness even many, many years after her passing. 
in deeds and legacies, and what I've seen first in my practice with families who lost a loved one, finding new purpose, not immediately when they're in the immediate throes of grief, but as time moves on, what they say is, I want to find something good out of this tragedy. I want to help others. I don't want other families to suffer as we did. I want to make a difference in other people's lives. And that's part of their healing, it turns out, as well. Finding ways to keep spiritual connections alive with our loved ones who have passed away. I still talk to my mother every day. Helping families attend to the grief means, means we have to do so not in this time-limited six sessions or eight sessions grief work that was the old model, but understanding from the research that there's an oscillation in attention of attending to grief, but having to meet the immediate demands and the adaptive challenges ahead. So our work with them is going to be really weaving back and forth as they have to cope with multi-stress demands. Some things to watch for, uh, and we hear this a lot right now because it's part of our culture of, you know, tough it out, I'm strong, I can do it all on my own, I shouldn't be dependent on anybody else, I should be able to manage it all, or I don't want to burden others, or there's shame in telling others to admitting to my children my retirement money is running out, I need help. Um, burnout is the result there. So it's helpful, as we know in our practice, to reach out, to help our clients, to mobilize them, to reach out to others for what they need. And to think of this not as, well, I don't wanna ask or burden them, but more in our interdependence. Uh, what can I do for you in turn? Or that someday I'm going to remember this and pay it back. Or I'm going to pay it forward for someone else who needs it. And that's our interconnectedness, our interdependence. Also to think more about teamwork, about caregiving teams. Um, so often we re rely in families on mom or on dad uh, to carry that load. And it's about really thinking of a collaborative team effort. And finally, to make time and space for grieving and self-care in the midst of all that has to be attended to. And we may have to strongly encourage people, help them to think about moments. Or can they trade off um, child care, maybe with a family member who's also home safe? What are ways that we can begin as we start to move out? We can't think of this as an all or nothing, that we're kind of trapped in confinement and then, woo, we're all out there. But step by step, what are the ways that we can begin to have more normalcy in our lives and to begin to turn to, share time with, be in spaces where we can have physical distance, and have some safety. We're going to have to help families help kids with all the loss, turmoil, and uncertainty. Open communication uh, is so important. To be honest and truthful, not to give false hopes, or not to uh, make promises that can't be kept. To, to give what we know in, with its uncertainties. And to know that this isn't just one conversation, but it's going to be many conversations, and that we want to listen for and look for the ways that children show their distress, and to invite them to talk to us, to, to tell us, um, to share with us what they're experiencing. Comfort and support, share coping strategies, and ways to remember, uh, and to re Remember that in times of turmoil or loss, uh, disruptions, that sometimes children, we think we're keeping them safer by keeping them on the sidelines. And actually, 
then when they're more isolated, they're more likely to worry or have fantasies. And it's important that they feel like they're part of the team. They're contributing something uh, also to uh, making the best of the time. So some of you know some of my uh, slides. Um, this is my favorite because this is our work. Um, there are many varied paths in recovery and resilience. And I think we're meeting people right now where the road has suddenly come to an abrupt ending. Uh, and we don't know, our clients don't know how to go forward. And our work with them is maybe helping them uh, process how they got here, uh, how they're gonna move forward and uh, not to make meaning for them, but to really know that they are experts in their own lives, to listen for their sparks of creative solution, of their ideas for how they might move forward, and maybe to expand possibilities that they might consider as they move forward. Uh, but we're really working with them uh, through this time that is uncharted. And the road ahead does not look like that. Uh, it looks more like one of these. Uh, and I think part of our work with them is uh, kind of being at their side as they're navigating this road ahead for whatever small piece of time that we are with them. Uh, let's hope that while the road is definitely going to be bumpy and they're not going to be able to see around every curve, uh, let's hope they're not careening uh, over the side like that. So we can't go too fast. We have to go slowly so that we can see a little bit around the bend. Uh, people are, keep asking the question, where, what's going to happen in six months from now, a year from now? And the experts say we just can't know yet. Forecasts are best just in front of us. So it's kind of like if we're out on a boat and there's, it's fog, we can see a little bit ahead and we have to be cautious as we're moving forward. We don't want to stay there and be wobbling back and forth. We have to make our way across, uh, but we have to do it slowly and carefully. So resilience in couples and families is about how what we do when something has happened. We may not have been responsible for it, maybe out of the blue. And it's about how we respond to the crisis and the challenge. It involves coping, adapting, and positive growth. And what I love about the concept of resilience is it's more than coping. It's a more, more than adapting. It's that through that struggle, through our experimenting, through deeping, digging more deeply into us for solutions, for invention, we become stronger, um, we build skills, and we become more resourceful in meeting future challenges. So in therapy or counseling, when we're working uh, with clients, uh, we're helping them to mobilize relational processes that will help them with crisis, trauma, and loss, with all the disruptive changes in their lives, and with the multi-stress persistent conditions. Now, when I've taught and worked in these situations, usually clients are experiencing just one of these. Uh, they might be going through a rocky divorce, or they might be have be recovering from an earthquake or a flood. But in this situation, it's so extreme that actually they're experiencing and we are experiencing all of this. And we have to keep in mind again, from our systemic perspective, that families can't do it alone. They're supported by social and community connections, by cultural and spiritual resources. So how do we help them draw on these resources? Who can help in their kin and social network, their chosen families, their, their couple bonds, uh, sibling bonds, 
for those of us at this age in life, often it's our lifelong friends that we turn to for emotional support. Some are better at emotional, not so good at practical. Some are better at practical. How do we find inspiration? And this is where we tap into our memories, our imaginations, um, stories of adversity and resilience, maybe that our families went through in the past, maybe other adversity that we faced, and to think about what helped to get through it, what helped to sustain, to endure, to overcome, and who helped, and how did they help at that time? Uh, those of you who know my work, many of you know that um, from all of uh, my three decades in this area, pulling together findings from research on individual and family strengths and resilience, I identified nine key processes. These are really beliefs and practices um, that uh, really are common and that we can help to strengthen in families help families to mobilize uh, as they are uh, reeling from this crisis. I wanna focus today just on a few beliefs and practices. Their roots and they are rooted in family history, in their position, in their society, in their community, in their culture. But it really uh, affects how people view their loss situation, their healing, and their future. So just very briefly, I wanna to touch upon a few of these that have to do with meaning making. Uh, most people at first try to make sense of what they're experiencing uh, by, by trying to grasp, get information about how it happened, what's happening. Um, and in some cases, it seems senseless. Uh, and the second way that people try to make meaning is what can we do in response? Uh, right now, uh, I think it's very important that people not get mired in trying to look back to where did it start? How did it start? And really be focused on what can we do now that can make a difference in positive reduction of virus and in positive adaptations as we move forward. So that there is a sense, not just in being affected by the virus and waiting to hear what's going to happen to us. Resilience is about how we feel we can be empowered in our own time and place uh, to do what we can that can make a difference. And what our local and our federal officials are going to do that are going to make a difference. A positive outlook is what I really want to focus, the importance of revisioning hope and mastering the possible, accepting what can't be changed. And finally, um, the transcendence, the values, the beliefs, and the practices that help us rise above the moment, rise above uh, what we feel mired in, uh, and the importance of spirituality and that process for solace, for inspiration, for future aspirations. And this is really important for us now for transformation, because in this crisis, we can evaluate, reevaluate what really matters, our priorities, our purpose, sense of purpose, often coming to a new purpose, and a positive growth that we feel happens out of this crisis. The work on post-traumatic growth is very important there. And again, what I mentioned about reaching out uh, in compassion and action uh, to benefit others. What's unhelpful about hope uh, I like very much the work of my colleague, uh, Kata Weingarten, on reasonable hope. It's very important not to hold false hopes or not to be relentlessly cheerful. Uh, and the difference from optimism, we may not be able to see around that corner. 
uh, we're hopeful that a virus, uh, uh, a, um, not a cure, but at least a way to, uh, to stop the transmission uh, will be just around the corner, but we're not sure. So what is helpful here for us around hope is not too quickly to look to how can it be good again, to take time with our clients to acknowledge the losses, the suffering and hardships, to help them rekindle and reorient their hopes, to master the art of the possible. And you know, this is my mantra because I really think this is the best we can do is to help clients focus on what they can control. Maybe just in their house. I work in the morning in the kitchen, in the afternoon, in the living room. I take my snack at a certain time. Uh, it establishes some regularity, some routine in the midst of this uh, sense of both being trapped and yet it being chaotic. Take active initiative and persevere. Accept what can't be changed, what's beyond control. And I think the hardest one is going to be to tolerate the uncertainty ahead. And as you know, I put big stock in humor about, here's the cat with the active initiative. He's not so sure. And it's the dog who's just going to get to the top of the stairs and it's going to take a long time. And that's my 14-year-old dog right now. So it's about mastering the art of the possible. Do all you can with what you have in the time you have in the place you are. About this transcendence and spirituality, um, these, I think I've just made these points so I'm gonna go forward here. To draw on spiritual resources, uh, that are consonant with each client's values and preferences, to find the values and practices that are going to be meaningful for you, for them, to create a sense of wholeness, of harmony and purpose. And what spiritual resources do is they foster a deep connection within ourselves and with all others. They help us get spiritual moorings, uh, they help to inspire us. So it could be through a faith community, belief in a higher power, through prayer and meditation, through nature, the creative arts and music. Uh, I listen to music all day right now. Um, my mother was a musician. Music has always been important to me. It really helps me get through the day when I start to feel down. Because with all of this, we aren't just relentlessly moving forward. There are days when we don't want to get out of bed, days when we're really sad or we're really, our brain is fuzzy. And again, that's part of what we're going through. So we need compassion for ourselves and compassion for others. The, the sustaining power of prayer and rituals, most important, I think, right now, is finding ways safely to get out into nature. It might just be in our front porch, out in the neighborhood, walking on the sidewalks, where it's safe. I love just looking outside. I took a picture here of just the first sprout, the first flowers that came out in our very small garden that is not being tended this year. And looking at that new life, is just so hopeful that nature, the seasons are going to come and they're going to go and they're going to come back again. I love, I've always loved this uh, picture uh, of Starry Night. Um, and uh, this is by Vincent van Gogh. I was fortunate to be working in the Netherlands uh, in this last spring. Uh, and I went to the Van Gogh Museum. And it really struck me because there's a lot of interpretations that people make. 
about what what is the meaning of that painting and some people say oh he was in an asylum it's his craziness or he had a, a visual distortion to some chemical thing in his brain and it brings back the importance that not to make meaning for other people uh, our job is to really try to listen and understand their meaning and i came across this plaque at the museum and something that van gogh wrote just a few months before he made that painting. He said, in a painting, I'd like to say something consoling, like a piece of music, to express hope through some star. I don't know, why just that, to express hope through some star. It just really touched me. And we're seeing sparks of creativity all around us on Facebook. Uh, one of my dearest friends and colleagues, Michelle Schenkman, I have her permission to show this, posted, she is in New York, cannot go to Brooklyn to see her granddaughter, uh, who is growing so fast. And so not they don't just say hello, how are you on FaceTime, but they make pictures together. And so her granddaughter said, okay, would you make a picture of my favorite animal, a flamingo, and, and have hearts in it too. And so Michelle made her this drawing and then showed it to her. And then it was her turn for Michelle to ask her, her granddaughter, to make a drawing for her. That really touched my heart too. And for us, we're gonna have to get very innovative in our practice. Uh, I love this. The, therapy maximizer uh, so take a look as we do ironically i was just uh, realizing that we may be able to do more conjoint family therapy because what really stifled us was that it was hard for families to get together at the same time and place to come in for a session people's lives were just too packed or they lived at a distance but now um, uh, John upstairs in his teletherapy room um, just met with a family where daughters are living in California, the parents are here, and they just had a Zoom telesession. So maybe this is going to uh, enable us to do more of what we really would like to do. And we need to take care of ourselves, our bonds with our companion animals, and to revitalize mind, body, and spirit. Our enjoyment with family and friends, however we can do it, and respite and self-care for ourselves. To support those struggling, we have to be fully present. And that's hard because there's no separation between therapist and client in the sense that we all have experienced and will experience loss in life. And so it's harder to do, but we need to offer a safe haven to bear witness of intense feelings. And to remember it's not a problem to solve. We can't bring back losses. We can be at their side, supporting their meaning making, facilitate their mutual support and to humanize, contextualize their intense distress, to explore meanings and implications of loss for them and in their lives, and a caution not to provide meaning and not to offer platitudes or homilies, uh, like at least it wasn't, or God never gives you more than you can carry, that people may find solace in their own expressions, but it may trivialize people's uh, experience if we try too quickly uh, to tell them it's going to be okay or to offer those kinds of homilies. Of course, it takes us back to Gregory Bateson and about the interconnectedness among all living beings. And it takes us to what matters I've talked about this, but I want to mention that it also makes us think about advocacy and social action in larger systems, collective efforts for systemic change, 
when we realize the importance of essential workers and low income workers who are risking their lives for us and they're also experiencing heightened losses and the impact of the pandemic with racial class and gender disparities. And also just a different example that we need to do something, not just to express our appreciation, but to change the odds against them, to really make their lives, their incomes, their income security, their benefits, what they should be, what other countries do. And finally, another example of with the clean air that's come up, we recognize our need for climate change and pollution. Finally, I guess I have a minute um, to think about time lost and found. And I'll just leave these with you. It's a time out, but it's time to reflect and reappraise. We aren't so busy with all the demands and activities that have filled our lives. Time travel, we can visit the past. We're not trapped in the here and now. It may help us see what we value and want to conserve, what we want to revise or do better. We can deepen connections by sharing stories and memories, exploring our family history and making scrapbooks. Now that I have the time to go through those boxes of photos, learning from the past, for painful memories, maybe it's time to heal old wounds. And don't take our future time for granted. That this is precious time to make the most of it. So I wish you the very best as we all navigate our way forward now. Thank you.